First of all, I would love to thank everyone who participated in the idea that the publication, public preposition, is going back to public. And I see some people having uh, the book on, on her or his laps, and I'm, I'm glad you, you took one. The idea came from the experience that I work for so many years now with people in the public realm, and there's so little I can give back. Okay, there's personal relationships sometimes, or personal experience, but then the publication goes through the publishing house, and from the publishing house goes to libraries, and from libraries it goes to bookstores. In May, here and there, some of those people have the chance to grab it. But sometimes I work with people, they cannot afford a publication. The regular price, not of this edition, this is for free and this is for you, but the regular edition in the bookstore is about $40. That's maybe the average budget of a person who has the un unemployed status for a week. Why this person should direct the budget to buy a publication? So that gives you the frame of what we have been done on the um, McMaster University campus in front of the museum. And the experience I, Ihor and I got was People had a certain hesitation. There was a kind of a moment where a lot of people, most of you, have been anticipating and taking the book, and it was also creating an, an, a moment of activity, like swarm intelligence moments. But then when you all had been gone, and we were signalized, or Ihor in particularly, when I was watching him, it was very difficult to draw attention to this kind of public gesture. So one can assume there is a kind of a suspicious or hesitation in getting things for free. Just recently, the German government is considering to prohibit to those who are giving the Quran in public space as a gift to especially younger people. I personally think that there should be a freedom of receiving things, and you have to read it, and you make your own judgment. But the German government is trying to, let's say, step forward and want to protect people being in, protect in uh, parties to uh, step forward and want to regulate this kind of, um, let's say, access to knowledge. The Bible, the Quran, the Torah are very traditional ways of providing history and they're very much, um, they're very important to our public um, situation. The way we look at things, the way we judge, uh, for instance, pictures, the way we judge the sound we hear, what is our closest relationship to light, to sound, so that all has, in most of the cases, uh, roots going back to the faith and the religious constitution. And I'm, I'm raised as a Protestant, so Martin Luther is something to be celebrated and critical, reviewed for the next year, but I'm doing that not only for the next year. But uh, today, I'm, I learned when I worked with the synagogue and the Jewish community that, you know, there is, it's all about exchange, it's all about communication. So, in particularly, I want to focus a little bit on what I call the margins of society. Those who maybe have not a big lobby, not a big reputation in our society, but they're still very active, they give influence. And even though I have to admit that maybe today we have to say that the majority needs a lobby, because we're so much driven by little groups and so much directed and reacting on little groups affecting so the society, something which is also a movement starting right now in Germany. Where does it all come from? So this model of education in the store and physics, so gymnasium and temple, so faith, knowledge and um, exercise, and, you know, had a strong, let's say, layout. The topography, as you can see, the roads are quite wide and also there is empty space. This whole arena, as you can still see the remains in Athens, in Greece, is called the Agora. And the Agora is one of the strongest reference points to the work I'm doing. That's it. exactly the space I have on mind. People are free to move. Everyone is invited, but it also is, it, is the right of the person to pass by, not to pay attention, not to get involved in a discussion. But at least there is an attempt to open up, not to singleize, and you will see well, we are looking at the activities right now in the world. This is a picture taken in Istanbul. Unfortunately, unfortunately, when it was taken in 2013, it now running into a very, very extreme actuality, simply because the current leader, Erdogan, is 
shrinking the rights of the people to speak out in public. There's a lot of press, journalists, artists, professors, faculty members of all universities in, in all over Turkey. They had been going into prison since the, um, um, what's called the rebel movement in late July. So a society and freedom is nothing fixed, it's something we have to work for. It's not, I'm not here to mission someone, but it's, I'm, I'm telling that also to myself. That's what I'm getting up every morning, to do something to extend the space of freedom, to extend the space of free expression. This is not a big barbecue party you're looking at. These are the protesters at the Taksim Square. And you know what's interesting is that in the times of digital media and social media, a lot of people get back into private domains and act from the private domain via digital media. So say, yes, I like it, or yes, oh, it's very terrible out there, yeah, 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 but they don't show up. Those people were very brave because they were absolutely surrounded by military observation. And most of them had been, you know, experiencing threats and personal injuries. The family, they, maybe they had been set off their jobs, you know. And it's not that the social system will carry them after that. So this is a very personal statement. And in this context, one has to read that, yes, as Ihor mentioned before, there's this group speaking out, but this group is built out of individuals. And these individuals will maybe take the opportunity to express their own idea. I was participating as a professor of the Fine Arts Academy in Helsinki. They had, the, the artist asked me, oh, you are specialized in public space. What would we do against this you know, financial criminals. And I said, what do you have on mind? Let's co-op with the Occupy Helsinki movement. And these people from Helsinki Occupy movement said, what are you going to contribute to our discourse? You are artists. What, I mean, what are you doing here? And we started a discourse. And after three months, we found out, yes, there is a possibility. Very little one, but we could get along and we could join them and could support their ideas. Well, this is a little bit more closer to you. And this is a very interesting moment in time. It has a very strong aesthetic, to my sense. Maybe you see it different, but I feel it's a strong con component. And these are the people who are the garbage taker in San Francisco. It's right on the edge of the civil rights movement in 1967. When this picture was taken, they had to protest because the working condition was so bad and the union were not really, not even the workers' union were paying attention to these members of the employment group, that they spoke out themselves. Just as a reference, if you're interested in this kind of protest culture, there's a very interesting book, it's called Global Activism, it has been printed by MIT Press, Massachusetts, and it was uh, edited by Peter Weiber, the director of the ZKM in Karlsruhe. And this exhibition shows what's global, what's, what's going on in the world in terms of protest. And a lot of artists decide to leave studio they go into public space, and even though they don't produce work, but they will be part of an energized or catalyst function in a civil rights movement. For this is a very typical word. It's, it's constructed, Vereinigungsfreiheit. If you look it up on Google Translate, you won't really get to some, um, um, let's say, meaningful translation. But it says, in the moment of, what's in, of, the, of the dynamics, those people were asking, for the rights of reunification between East and West Germany. On the occasion of the, let's say, of a big exhibition of the uh, um, Russian constructivist Kazimir Malevich, of his, you know, all, all of us know the Black Square. It's a kind of a departure between, it's a, it's a cutting edge point in art history. Some people thought, oh, it's coming alongside the, um, the experience of the Russian Revolution. So we may, the artists may introduce the new aesthetics to the world. At the same time, when you look at this in the exhibition, you have the impression of it is um, domesticated. It, it has somehow, in the museum, it has a certain kind of flavor. So I had the idea to transform the Black Square as a public performance. So there was one article in the newspaper saying, come dressed white or black. If you're dressed white, you're supposed to be the frame. If you're dressed black, you are supposed to be in the center. 
The interesting thing is that also people, some of you also have a red shirt, they said this is the new black. <laughs> people were chanting Smolensk. There was a monk, he was going very slowly. So you can imagine to orchestra a, a square was only possible in the very beginning and I was really running around to get the people, you know, in shape, I would say. But after a few moments, it was a stretched rectangle because it, I'm not a military person. I'm not an officer telling people what people should do or not. So they took all of them their own pace. So after 90 minutes, I think we made it into a really respectfully looking um, long rectangle. But this is in the very beginning, so it is almost looking like a square. Just as an aside, this is the Hamburg Kunsthalle by Oswald Matthias Ungers. This is the old building, and here you find the cube, the black cube by the German artist Gregor Schneider. He was representing Germany at the 2001 Biennial, and he won the Golden Lion. And he tried to put this black square on the, I, I, I was supposed to say Medina, but I, it is exactly, his proposal was in the center of the St. Marcus Square, with, in front of the Byzantic um, Cathedral. And the interesting thing is that the curators of that time in 2003 said, no, it's impossible. Two years after 9-11, no, no, you cannot do that. We are offending the Islamic world. And actually, all the imams were supporting it. They said, yes, just try. It's an artwork. Yes, we understand. We understand. We share your fascination of a black cube. Even though that the cardboard has a different, not only the shape, but also has the stone and, you know, then the curtain. A lot of things are different, but there's this kind of a similarity in terms of size. But the Hamburg Kunsthalle, on, this, you know, for, on the reason for the Malevich show, was accepting this. I'm showing you this picture just for a simple reason. As the museum called the police to announce that we are going to do this performance, they asked for an estimate $20,000 as a fee for us to protect this demonstration, to get rid of traffic and to ensure security. But as citizen Cuba, I have the right to protest. And I was organizing a demonstration. Police was covering me and s ensuring the safety for nothing. <laughs> so what, I, what do I learn? It is good to work as an artist, but sometimes it's better to do this on the background of a citizen. The citizenship incorporates a lot of rights. Can I extend extensively declaim or proclaim that I use my rights. Yes, at this point I can say that. When I talked to the police officer responsible for the city of Hamburg, he told me that his whole team is prepared to serve the citizens. This is, happened in June 86, 1986. For 48 hours, 800 people had been kept circleized by the police without food, nutrition, toilets, whatever. Because this was a protest against the nuclear power station in Germany. That was the highest peak. And the people were taking off their civil rights. Can you imagine? So this was a big scandal. And here's my black square again. But here we're looking at street fighters squattering buildings in the city of Hamburg, surrounded by the white helmet police. Aesthetically, that's a strong connection, and I was sublimely trying to play with this ambiguity between what happened in Hamburg already, where the civil rights had been taken out for a long time. 48 hours is a long time if you have to stand in the, you know, during day and night and you cannot get, get off this situation, and this protest. And I think that was the reason when the, um, my ex-colleague in Karlsruhe, Boris Groys, took this. This is the maquette. And actually, I made a black and white printing for everyone who participated. It was numbered and signed to each participant. We had in total 650 people. More would be better. And this is, the, is taken from Edward Hocha's demonstration in Albania. He was a communist dictator, and he could organize things like that. So I, I just did some... Um, um, yeah, manipulation on the image, and I put the, the Hamburg skyline in the back. This is a photograph taken by my colleague Wolfgang Tillmans in 1992, as he 
picture that private shops are buying these uh, fabricated um, concrete pyramidal structure stones which you can use to avoid people lying in front of the shopping window. This is a way how public space is shrinking by private and commercialized needs. And this practice is now you maybe have two rows of stones to get even more space. But you know this person there, maybe he uses alcohol too, too much or he's just tired and laying there. We don't know about the story about this person. It's not delivered. But definitely from the shop owner's perspective, it's a non-productive situation. He's not a consumer. He's not bringing, pouring money into the system. Talking about reintroduction of the physical presence of the body in public space. This is the, he is a choreographer from uh, Turkey. Adem Gündünes is his name. He simply stands in front of the media building in, at Taksim Square and facing the building, not saying a word. I don't know, I think this is not a, a statement but this is one, so he has been joined by other people. And they were protesting, even though the police was asking him to leave after two days. But he was constantly standing there and always returned back. So that's also a way of um, you know, getting into a protest line without maybe showing signs so much and not about shouting but, and, and marching around. But it's very much so, it's a political statement itself that you as an individual show resistance to the public authority. And for sure you get recorded, not only in Turkey, but for sure in that situation right now in Turkey. Most recent, there is this Nuit debout, so debates in public space is at the Place de la Libération in Paris, where people just gathered every night, as they may have done at the Cinématique, to Paris in 1967 when the French uh, protest started. You know, it started with very little things. It's always little things steering up to a bigger, bigger picture. I spoke about my involvement as a Protestant educated person in a synagogue in Stommel. Stommel, well, it's hard to look it up, but it's near to Cologne and it is the only um, synagogue which had not been destroyed. This is the grand a synagogue in the city of Hanover. You don't find a synagogue in Hanover anymore. You just find a, a small plate saying it was here. So what the Nazi regime really achieved in a very, very um, sad way is that a real big part of the German society history of the cultural um, inheritance has been taken away. It has been not only destroyed, I mean that was even worse too, but not only destroyed the building, but also destroyed identity. I know that these people who did it did not look at this the way I'm, I'm talking to you right now. So what we find here is a very small synagogue, not bigger than this part of the room, 35 to 45 square meter. And it survived because the Jewish community already left before the pogrom in November 1938. And that's why, because they kind of sensed there was something coming up to them and they wanted to escape. Most of the families went to Tel Aviv and started a new life. When the project started, they renovated this building, gave it back to the community and started an art program. The first artist was Janis Kunelis, the second one Richard Serra, the third one was the German one, Georg Baselitz, and then there was a big scandal about the connection of uh, Baselitz's work to the synagogue. And I wrote a letter, as I also initiated myself the project with the Mannesmann building. So I'm not waiting in the studio, I'm, I'm approaching people, I'm going to, knocking at people's doors, say, look, this is the idea, let's talk about it. It sometimes works and sometimes not. In this case, they, re they responded and asked me to uh, realize the work. The idea was to lock the door, to put the lights behind the windows, so when you enter the building, or you wanted to enter, you were just in the limelight, but you couldn't get in. You were excluded. Very similar to the experience of the Jewish community. From one day to another, you're not being part of it anymore. You cannot educate, you cannot do your business, you cannot talk to people, you're not allowed to go to university as a student or as a professor or whatever. 
So this kind of exclusion, I think, is a very strong moment. When I speak about it, I think, what does it deliver when I say the word excluded? But to stand in front of this building, trying to get in the door, you have a kind of a certain physical and maybe social, mental experience, which is stronger than a picture can tell. Oops. So what is most important to me was the connection between the synagogue, the project, and the people living around. So Minna is a woman, Minna Fezen. She had the perspective on the synagogue like that. And this is from the family called Zawaland. It's a very common name. And you can see they were sleeping in the backyard facing the synagogue. So we had to give them extra strong cotton to protect the light. Otherwise, the kids couldn't sleep in the evening. Because that was running 24 hours for 12 weeks. Well, you can say, oh yeah, it's another art project. Mm -hmm. OK, dealing with history. Got it. But 1994, in Germany, there were a lot of assassination and attacks against minorities coming from different countries in the world. One could say that, like kind of a xenophobia situation. But what's happening when you invite people to speak out in public? Not only take something from their private domain into the public area, as a Biennale is very public, even you know in Canada, yeah, there is the speaker's corner where you can say everything you want if you don't step on the grounds of the, of the empire, right? But what is the, the critical thing about that? This is the area where in Europe is considered to be the most surveillanced city in Europe. It's London. 3.2 million surveillance cameras. I, I was invited to teach public art at the Goldsmiths College. People were, students were reporting to me that they, they were trying to put a cardboard on a pedestrian. They could not even finish. In less than two minutes, police drove by and stopped the action. You are not allowed to do that. You have no permission. Stop. Even though you have the, this tradition, as you can see. In Halle, I was invited by the city, by the city museum Moritzburg. It is, a, as you say, it's a castle. And all the exhibition spaces are behind that big, this uh, tower and behind big, thick walls. But I refused to take that. I was constructing this permanent fi light fixture. On the other side, I established a stage, just five by, by six or si five by seven meters. And as you could see with the website, in 2000, this project was executed. Everyone was invited to step on the stage and speak out. So looking at this guy, he went on stage, as many others did, reading silently, Richard Sennett and other different authors about public space. After he finished the page, he took it out, been taken by the wind, or distributed by him. He sent it 100 faxes and pamphlets against my intervention in Halle and Saale, because he thought it was a kind of a dominance in his public realm, it is his city. And he found it a bit like overtaking from a person coming from the west part of Germany, Dusseldorf, and going to the east part and showing people the status quo. While I'm saying that is a reference to the history. After 12 years Nazi Raymond, from 33 to 45, in 1945, the uh, East German um, GDR, the communist uh, Raymond, started to 1989, as you know. And, uh, when I did it, this piece in 2000, still a lot of people were not you know, prepared to reoccupy the public space on their own demands. Because in communistic and Nazi regime times, public space was surveillance, but not by cameras, but by people. So in the end, after the, the two kind of major uh, um, dictatorships, people were suspicious about the neighbor, even family members, could have revealed details from dinner talks and reported to other people, and some of those people maybe went to the concentration camp. I was in Katowice on Friday, and I left uh, on Sunday from Detroit, which I, where I arrived from yesterday. I did execute a project with the people um, of a, they had actually 
invited different artists to intervene in the public space. And my idea was to convert a, a regular street, can, uh, street car into a public sculpture. I found a woman. She wanted to drive on Wednesday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, finished. And she was just driving around with the streetcar on all tracks, connecting different cities. And she never stopped. Here, this car tried to stop the tram, knocking at her door to find out what's the whole purpose of this. Because we didn't introduce it to the public. It was just appearing. So I addressed this work to an unexperienced and unprepared audience. What is interesting about the work for me was that people were writing to the mayor of the city, my grandmother was sitting in the streetcar. My assistant, Claudia, she's from Poland. So we, had, we got the original words from those people. It's only 38 kilometers to the concentration camp Auschwitz. There are two death camps. One started as a small village, and then the second one is a, was a death camp as a factory. It was all based on a perfect, perfid, an inhuman transportation system. So everything that moves in the city and has this kind of sacred, untouchable kind of component, obviously increased the opportunity for people to project their dreams or their memories to this streetcar. There was nothing on it, no name, no nothing, no written explanation at all. And you could not find anything on the web before or during the process, it started after. So the people did their projection. Putting that into account, I started to work on the white space. I was invited to the 25th anniversary of the reunification between West and East Germany. Can you imagine that 60,000 people gather? Yes, you can, because in this country you can organize a protest and it's possible. You gather on a big square and that's it. In communistic time, even those attitudes or these kind of actions to gather in public space were absolutely prohibited. So when the people met on the 9th of October in the center place of Leipzig, most of them artists, by the way, because there's the art school very close to that place, and the artists joined that. There was for them also a way to speak out in public. They decided to march. The police was watching from the roofs of the surrounding buildings. They telephoned to the headquarters in Berlin, should we shoot or not? And why we know this as a peaceful revolution? Yes, because they said, no, don't shoot. And that's the beginning of the falling apart of the communistic system in East Germany. Because people were brave and said, critical thinking needs time and space here and everywhere. I reenacted that banner. It was done by an anonymous person and brought it all over Germany to different places. And I put it up again and again because it's timeless. It's always the right moment to request this demand. Time, space for critical thinking here and everywhere. That's what it says in a very, you know, amateur, amateur kind of uh, writing on this white linen. So what I did, I created this area with heavy fog. The, the people were gathering, 220,000 people gathered in four hours, redoing, reenacting the tour, and passing by all these interventions. And here they spent a lot of time looking at what and taking selfies in front of what. Can you imagine if you do a selfie? What do you see? You see you in front of that. And why did this work? Because it was not proclaiming and saying something to the people. It was just a basin, a vessel, to contain or invite people to project and give something to that particular moment. It's hard to say while you're sitting here in a comfort zone, everything is easy. You're not involved. I understand that you look critical and say, hmm, how, does, how is this going to work? But it works because there is a moment 
where a lot of people have the same kind of energy and they share it and you have not the chance to speak to everyone. So what you share is, a, is an atmosphere, is a moment, or as Claire Doherty would say, it's a situation. You are in it. And this situation is created by the context. And there's a certain time, it maybe lasts only for a couple of hours and then it's not be recreatable or reput, uh, repeatable in a way. Something I'm interested in is introducing things which we know but not common to our life anymore. I invited 350 sheep to participate in a demonstration. Well, you can say, well, did I really speak to every sheep? <laughs> he did. <laughs> but you can see here and there, there are some bluish dots. The regulation, the veterinary regulation in Switzerland, yes, it's the highest level. I would love to see children being treated like that with this wonderful supervision. Don't touch them. Don't let them do things they don't want to do. Or if they can't do, don't force them to do that. These animals are 150% protected. Doctors had to inspect them again and again. And then I invited them to do a march through the city of Bern. I was part of an international theater festival. Actually, it was dedicated to Terry Fox, which I personally very admire a lot. I opened a theater. I took all the windows out. I broke out the doors. I blocked the street and made this theater a public space for 48 hours. And the cheap were the first ones entering that new public's domain. And they left everything they could leave <laughs> by nature. And then it was a public space. You can see the windows were out, doors out. And then we had to clean this a little bit. You know, cleaning is another big issue in Switzerland, another dossier like that. Then it was this public space. And then they closed the doors, put the windows in, put the seats in and the stage, and it was a theater. And it was reported that at least three weeks after, still the odor of the cheap were present in this room. I did this because the sheep just live in the mountains and in the cities we don't just know them as lamb shops on, on the table or uh, in the fridge but we don't see them as animals anymore and as you know a lot of artists had given a lot of attention to them. Um, they painted them, Agnus Dei, yes, we celebrated on paintings but what we do with the real thing smells, stinks, demands feed, you know, demands uh, nutrition. To bring it there, it was because the theater used to be a slaughterhouse. But as the theater was going on there for 30 years, people were not thinking about the slaughterhouse anymore. So I introduced, reintroduced at least that animal. It was the final destination of mo most of the animals when they entered that space. But in this case, every sheep was safe. Mm. This project is very difficult to explain because um, there is coinciding with different events in the world. I mean, one can say, yes, it happened a lot of things to me in 2010 or in 2011 to each of you individually. But let's say in a global context, there were two things very, um, very strongly um, um, happening to the people in Christchurch, New Zealand, which is on the South Island. It's actually the hub for most of the expeditions in the um, Antarctica. And um, what happened was a, a big earthquake in, in September 2010 and again in February 2011. Just four weeks 11, at the uh, 11th of uh, February and just two weeks, uh, so, sorry, four weeks before uh, Fukushima happened. Fukushima pro probably got more attention in the world because it has a strong effect on the use and the usage and the future of nuclear power, at least in Germany. You may have sensed that Germany was the first country stopped everything and Japanese just switched off all the power plants and then switched them on and China decided to build another 50. Well, that's not really in balance. My work was dedicated to an idea um, elaborated by a colleague of Ihor, it's uh, a common friend, I should say hello from Blair. Blair French, who is now uh, 
curator at the um, Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. And he was the appointed curator for a public art event, which is under the umbrella of SCAPE. SCAPE actually started as art and industry. Give something to the city, sculptural projects, and here and then some performances, but basically it is about sculpture. Not drop sculpture, but let's say site-specific sculptures in public space. But the devastation through the earthquake, 50,000 people left a city of a population of 250,000, that has a major impact. But 20,000 different people came, blue-collar workers, engineers, architects, with the idea for reconstructing and rebuilding. A master plan group in London, UK, was layouting two alternative uh, ideas. One was to remove the whole city to another place, maybe a calmer in terms of earthquakes, because there are minor earthquakes around 300 to 1,000 a year in that particular area. And it also goes up north now. Wellington has been affected. There was an earthquake just recently in Oakland. So this area is very busy. But the city decided, the government decided to rebuild on the same spot. So what is the consequence for a curator? What, can we just go on, or the artists, we just go on doing projects? Or do we have to reconsider our status quo? What can we do in a situation as such? Well, I don't have an answer, but at least I, I started a project or a process. The idea was to involve other cities in the world, either being sister cities of Christchurch, as they are an international hub for the Antarctic exploita uh, exploitation. Yes, maybe exploitation, but also <laughs> exploration. Sorry for that. But that's one thing. And the other thing is the network of the artist. So what I did here is um, I just grabbed a few cities which I have a relation with, and I asked them if they would give us a regular street lamp for the rebuilding process in Christchurch. I found, lucky enough, I found a shipper who was able to transport from every part of the world for me for free to Christchurch. That's the biggest, the biggest obstacle I, I had to, uh, to um, solve. That was the very beginning, but then we learned, you see this change is that the idea was in the master plan that these even though the buildings are not destroyed, should be removed completely to have a green frame going around the city to give extra space for evacuation. The most serious damage is from falling building parts. So you have to step not just between two buildings and on the street where both building sides can reach you. You have to be on a safer area. And that was the idea to have a green strip, which is called the frame. The city will build this. So now you see sources. This comes from Wuhan in China. And this is from Sopot in Poland, near Gdansk in the north of Poland. And sometimes, and that's the most important thing, a delegation comes alongside with the lamppost. So again, like in Brazil, you have this change and exchange thing. I, I, I forgot to tell you that only 17 one seven out of the 72 families decided to rechange. All the others kept my lamp and I kept their lamp. Just to let you know. And here, when the lamp was shipped, that is logistic, this is transportation. But what does it do? Pay on the community. What, what is the, how is the community involved? Yeah, people are coming, visit the space, oh, sorry, visit the place, and meeting other people. And this kind of exchange is happening now with each participant city. So they sent the delegations, sorry, from uh, different places in the world. I was attending Sopot, I was attending Wuhan, I was attending Kurashiki. I go there minimum twice a year. Now the budget is gone. It was already gone two years ago, but we found extra money, but now we ran out of budget to pay for the shipping transportation, so we had to stop at this limit. And I think it always stands pars pro toto. I mean, who could say that 21 cities are what? A percentage of what in terms of relation to what can be done for the future, but maybe it's someone else taking on a mission or using other uh, different tools to connect this, this area in particular with the world. As you understand, the people from Kurashiki or Sendai, they share the grief of experienced earthquake, tsunami, and this kind of experience and events. But when I got the lamb from Boston, 
the person who was attending this project said, in 24 hours, I got every paper done. It was unbelievable. I mean, administration, everyone knows what that means, especially when you're teaching at university. A paper runs through in 24 hours and you get permission for everything. That because they said we had an earthquake. I looked it up, earthquake, Boston, no results. Yes, there was one. There was one in the Constitution of Public Awareness when five years ago, the Marathon in Boston has been attacked by two bombers. So they took this as a metaphor. The earthquake, what happened in Christchurch is a physical earthquake, but what happened in Boston is physical plus the mental shift. And you know, they have the common, the place where the people were discussing public issues in the Agora of the city of Boston. And exactly outdoor, those people had been struck by the terrorist attacks, and that is the earthquake. Now we're getting back to Germany. One of my favorite cities, it's bankrupt, no future. Coal mining just stopped. 3,800 people been un unemployed from one day to another, but you, they knew before. A lot of renovation has to be done. What's better to do? Making a gift. I'm referring to a person which is also in the room next to you, on your left. All the way down, you're looking at three times at Joseph Beuys. He is the most influential artist ever in Germany. As he grabs the history of art, relates himself to the fr fragility of uh, Wilhelm Lehmbruck, he incorporates the idea that artists can work in social realm and can have an influence and you can change the methods, the aesthetics. I think that's a wonderful gift. And he made, he made a lot of talkings, sit-ins, performances, colloquiums, seminars, whatever, just for free. He was a very cheerful person. I know him because I was his laundry boy. Okay, that was my first job to finance my studies. I had a license, driver license, and he was one of my clients. Best coffee, promise. <laughs> what we're looking at is a picture, him in conversation. I cannot tell about much about that. I have a guess who is this person on the left side. He's a journalist, maybe, but I know him, maybe. But it's good to see him in action. He's always towards the people, never leaning back. He always towards the people. I think that's, in German, there is a word, it's called Sozialheimer. That's a person who's always ready to pick up other people's problem. Well, we take this with a bad connotation, and it was like 20 years ago, because that's how I started, to work with homeless people, with uh, kindergarten uh, kids in social uh, project uh, buildings. As I studied psych psychology, as I studied social pedagogy, never studied art, so he was my hero. What we're looking at in the center of the picture is a rose, and it says in German, Ohne die Blume machen wir es nicht. Can you imagine there's a person, such political person saying, without the flowers we are not doing it. What does it mean? Remember Prague, when they put the rose into the tank. When you see this little gesture when flowers are introduced in a very military moment where this kind of ambiguity, where it goes into that or that direction. We don't know, right? We offer a peaceful gesture, but how it will be responded. What he's doing is, he is actually pleading that we have to ensure and maintain the fragile moment of democracy. This work consists, it's a glass cylinder, at that height, 35 centimeters, filled with water and a fresh rose. You have to replace the rose as the symbol that we have to revitalize our demands of democratic freedom in our society. It's not forgiven, it's not just there. It's there, but we have to maintain it. And this is the big work and gesture of it. It's an addition, not very expensive. I've seen this work in a museum in Denmark, a plastic rose, a plastic rose in an empty glass cylinder. And I wrote to the director, it's absolutely impossible. And I put Eva Boyce in CC, just to let her know that's the widow, and she knows exactly what to do in this case. You cannot replace 
this water and this rose because you think water should not be in the exhibition collection room. That was the reason why they didn't do it. But you destroy the idea. And if you destroy the idea, better don't expose or exhibit the work. Why I'm showing it is because I want to make a connection between Charles Baudelaire, when he wrote in, nine, in 1851 a selection of poets, which is called Les Fleurs du Mal, the flower of the bad, the flower of the weakness, whatever is the translation in English. Maybe there's a, an appropriate one. We say in German, we say, Die Blumen des Bösen, the flowers of the evil. Can you imagine I gave this as a present to the city hall? This is the city hall. Here's the museum. Here's where the people go for parliament. And in here is the wedding section. So all the wedding couples coming down here. And I gave them a, a concrete vase to put their flowers there. There are two things you need to know. When this book was published in 8051, it was banned after three months. What he was doing is he was expressing himself to the public through very subjective comments, lyrics, poems. And the society wasn't ready. It was Queen Victoria's time in England. And there was absolutely no sexual accessibility in the society. It was absolutely banned. And there was this French guy he thinks he can speak about it in public. Absolutely no. It was republished 20 years later. And you can see there are different kind of status of overpainting graffiti, street art, whatever, in that particular city. And you know the city is called Marle. When we brought it up, the people said they have no money, not even for the R. <laughs> I was like, God! I visited the city several times. I went to the coal mine. I went down 1,200 meters into the grounds. I spent a workshop there. I worked with the people in the chemistry industry. I did this and that and this and that and that. I visited the, peop the pupils in the school and talked to the parents. And hmm. What happened now is, after three years procedure, I gave it as a gift. And after 13 months, the, the people of Marl had to decide if they want to keep it or not. And they voted yes. We want this critical, the flowers of the evil, written on our city hall, reminding us that we have to do something. They started DIY courses. It sounds like a romantic story, but it's the truth. And it started with the gift, and this I want you to listen carefully. It's you start with something, you have to be cheerful. You cannot expect something people should do under very difficult circumstances. Unemployed, no money, no future, and then you ask them, can you do this and that? No, they won't. But if you give something to them, then people are maintaining. This is a typical wedding flower thing, right? They drop it there. They drop it there. And they did build fantasy things. Maybe different people putting something there. Or make a statement there. Yes. But when it's empty, it's worse than before. Without the flowers, you didn't think about it. But then you have the fleur du mal, and you have the empty vase. It doesn't last a day. There are people coming from all over Germany, driving by train or whatever, getting there by car, buying flowers and putting it there to maintain the process. At school, they started to read Charles Baudelaire in French lessons, in French original language. So it becomes infiltrating through different generations part of a common sense. If you had been going there three years ago, what is Le Fleur du Mal? Ah, I don't know, I don't speak French. Now people at least can say what it means, and they're, they're proud, and they don't know the artist maybe, but they know it's a present. We didn't pay for it. And why I'm mentioning it, it is, it is a way and method to think about as an artist to interfere or interact in public space and not waiting to be invited. I've just found someone who paid it. You know, we're talking about maybe $50,000. There's so much 
philanthropic money out there if you just present an interesting concept. I just heard that when I was in Detroit. I spoke to people of an NGO organization in Detroit, and they have a $2 billion budget for five years to spend for the community. And every one of the tour bus said, oh, how did they get the money? Yes, they presented an idea, and they why philanthropic money goes to. No, it's not a return of investment. It's not about break even. It's about giving something to society because there are people around us, maybe not everyone in this room, but some of us, who can give something. And this is just one way of doing things. This always remains in the dark, and that's the big gesture. But I had a problem, and I was telling that in the, in the very beginning of this presentation. I involved so many people. I couldn't get them in the museum, because there still is an obstacle, is a hurdle in front of to get there. You think you need to be educated to understand German expressionism. And if you don't get it, how you can create an access to it? OK, here's the first public preposition book presentation in the public space. And people who never been to a library, never been to a museum, just could grab a copy and lining up to get a signature. And that for them was very easy to say, hi, I'm Margaret or Stacy or whatever, Hans and glad to meet you. Because outside the museum, we are just people. We should be also just people inside the museum, but outside the museum is more obvious. There is not, doesn't mean if he or is a curator or not. He's a person. He's a citizen. And I am, and you all are citizens. And here we are meeting in front of the museum on a public space. And that's for you to remind what happened today? Some of you may picture yourself. And that's the moment. And I like that. We have to do that because, <laughs> because if we are not watching our territories outside, the territories we are looking at, I mean, this is just one example. As I mentioned, this is just a symbol for what's going on worldwide, you know. This, this kind of de uh, development. We have to avoid that. OK, he is threatening us in a way, but it has a cynical component in it. But at the same time, um, if we step out of public space and just look back on our private realms, we give that space maybe to other political reasons, and uh, we should fight. Thank you.